We take the bottom note, actually let's start an octave lower. We take our bottom note and we move it up an octave. So there's our G chord in first inversion, B, D, G. And if we invert it again, we do the same formula. Take the bottom note, bring it up an octave. There's our new shape. There is second inversion, G major. Hey everyone, good morning. Well, depending on where you're tuning in from, of course. I see Terry already on. How you doing, Terry? Nice to see you. You got your cup of coffee, that's good. I'm jealous, I had one earlier, but I could use another, I think. But this is fun, we're here on a Saturday now, uh, because I wanted to test a different day of the week for you guys. We've been doing weekdays recently, and I think a lot of people are at work or maybe asleep, depending on the time zone. So uh, we wanted to try this Saturday lesson to, uh, to see if that works better for some of you guys. So let me know below in the comments, give a thumbs up or anything you want, if this day and time is, is working well for you. Um, before we start, guys, I just want to play a little bit, right? It's Saturday. Let's have some fun. We're going to get into an awesome lesson today, but is it okay if I just play for a minute? Let's do that. I'm just going to be playing. Just let me know if we're, just say live. Are we live? I'm sorry if you guys uh, experienced just a bit of a technical difficulty there. We got cut out, but I think we're back. So I'm going to play for another minute to make sure we're good, and then we're going to get into this lesson, okay? Still here? Aiden, we looking good? Okay guys, once again, sorry, but we are here today now, ready to get into this lesson. I see a lot of comments already coming through, so thank you for hanging out on a Saturday. Today, we are going to be talking about a topic you guys voted on in my last YouTube poll, which is how to practice better. This is a great topic. I was excited to see that you guys were excited for this topic. Everyone knows that you have to practice, but not many people know how to do it well, or I should say in the most efficient and productive way possible. And often that can be a source of frustration because you know you got to do it, you sit down to do it, and you're not really seeing the results that you want to see, and you may not be sure why that is. It may be discouraging. It may actually throw you off of your plans to improve at the piano. And nobody wants that. We don't want that. One of our missions here at Playground is to make playing, including practicing, as fun and engaging as it can be for you guys. So today we're going to be talking about how to practice better. And the first thing I'd like to do before we get into that topic is to check these questions and comments. I want to hear from you guys, and so I want to scroll through just a bit and see what you guys are saying. So Terry's here. Hey, Terry. Hello, John. ENJ, ENJ, Saturday would be great. I'm seeing a lot of people saying Saturdays work well. That's cool. We're going to find the best time for you guys, and we're going to try to bring these lessons to you during those times. Saturday is much better. Saturday is much better. Saturday works for me. Awesome. This is good. Thanks, Terry. Oh, I see Chris Vance writing in. I don't need to practice. Chris. <laughs> Chris is our CEO and he's hanging out with us. Everybody give a wave to Chris Vance. Say hey to him uh, and tell him that he's wrong. He's got to practice. 
he's got to practice just as much as any of us. So Chris, glad to see you here. Um, let's get into this lesson. So the first thing I want to talk about is your space, right? The space in which you practice, where you have your piano, where you have your keyboard, where you have your Playground Sessions interactive app set up, I hope. This is your temple for the piano. Now, it's easy in everyday life. Trust me, I get it. I'm busy. I got kids. You know, it's easy to let clutter pile up, right? It's easy to walk in and throw your keys on the desk, throw your bag down, throw some papers or some mail on your keyboard. Obviously, you have to clean and respect your space, okay? That's my first thing I want to say. It might seem obvious, it might not, but you can't walk into a messy, cluttery room and expect to have productive, focused practice time, okay? So the first step is you gotta respect your space. You gotta keep it clean and tidy if you're serious about wanting to get good practice, okay? Now the second thing is kind of tied in with that, but it's this notion of eliminating distractions, okay? Clutter can be a distraction, but even if you have a clean, pristine space, you could still have your phone out. You could still have the game on in the background. Chris, I know that's something that you got. You got that nice TV set up there and your piano's here. You could easily turn to the right, you know, see how Tiger's doing or see how your, your team's doing. So it's important that you eliminate the distractions even after you've cleaned up, okay? Turn off the TVs, shut it down. And in fact, I even like to say, go ahead and just go into airplane mode. That's my final bullet here for this one. I like to think when I go into practice time, I'm on airplane mode. Sometimes I literally put my phone on airplane mode or I'll leave it in the other room, but I like to eliminate all distractions. I tell my wife and kids, give me a minute. I got to have some, uh, some, some uninterrupted focused time. So I'm going to be on airplane mode. Okay. So that's the first thing I want you guys to, to take away from today's lesson. Think about your space. Is it set up in an optimal way for you to practice without distractions? And are you respecting that space? You got to start with that, okay? Now, once you have that down, there's still a little bit of considerations for before you actually start playing the keys, okay? So before you practice, your space is all set up now, but before you practice, you want to think about something called time management. Again, some of this stuff might seem obvious, but a lot of people just jump right in. They sit down and they just start playing something and then they check the clock and they say, hey, it's been 20 minutes. I think I, I practiced enough. There's no time management going on in that scenario. Okay. So you need to be proactive about your session. As you sit down, you need to have a good sense of how much time you're going to put in, in that session. And there isn't so much a right or wrong amount of time. It's however much you can put in, in that moment. And I really want to stress that because some people think, oh, if I don't have an hour or two hours to practice, it's not worth it. That's just not true, okay? You can even sit down for 15 minutes of focused practice time, practice time, as long as you are utilizing some good time management practices. So even if you've only got 15 minutes, you gotta have that time really assigned and, and, and intentionally used, okay? So time management's important. The next thing is kinda tied in with that is that you gotta make a plan. So you got your time set. Let's say you got 30 minutes. What are you gonna do in that 30 minutes? You're going to just play piano? You could, but it depends on what your practice goals are. If you want to work on sight reading, you got to make a plan for that. And we're going to talk in a little bit later about how to plan for that kind of stuff. But the first thing is key. You have to have a plan, okay? And then that plan typically could look like dividing your time into smaller chunks. And that's the next thing I want to talk about. So if you've got 30 minutes, here's how you should do it. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to carve it out. But here's one uh, sort of hypothetical way that you could do it. All right, I got 30 minutes to practice. The first five minutes are going to be a warm-up, for example. And then the next 10 minutes, I'm going to work on a song that I'm working on, specifically maybe a challenging spot. And then the next 10 minutes is going to be working on sight reading, for example. And then the final five minutes, I don't know if my math is right there, but you get what I'm saying. Really divide it up into smaller chunks. And one little bonus of doing that is that you will often find that your practice session will go by much faster and much smoother than you were expecting because you're not just looking at 30 minutes of practice in front of you. You're looking at mini goals, 
Five minutes of this, done, achieved it. 10 minutes of this, got it, okay? Then you're moving through that 30 minute session a lot quicker and you're kind of tricking yourself into getting more practice or at least getting it done faster, okay? Now the last thing I wanna say for the before you practice section is that you know, you don't have to do this, but it can definitely help, especially if you're a little bit more scatterbrained than, than others, is to keep a practice log, okay? And that could look like anything you want. It's really just for your internal, it's for yourself to be able to track your progress. Now, of course, if you're using the Playground Sessions interactive app, you already know that the app tracks your progress for you, and you can go in and look at all your charts and graphs, and, and it's, it's super cool. But even if you're not tracking in the app, I think it's great to have a notepad next to your keyboard or your piano. And as you're making a plan, dividing up your time, you can write that down. When you're done with your practice session for that day, you should also jot a note or two down. And what that's gonna do is over time, you're gonna be able to track your progress, pick up where you left off in your last practice session much better. And there'll be a lot less of this. What was I doing last week? Where did I stop my practice session last time, right? So instead, you can refer back to your practice log. That's going to make your session a bit more productive as well. So now, we've cleaned our room. We've respected our space. We've eliminated distractions. We've carved out some time. We've made a plan for that time. We've divided it into chunks. Now we're ready to practice, right? So let's talk about what happens during practice and what we should be thinking about to make that a lot more productive. How should you divide your time? Now I already alluded to this a bit, that there's a lot of different ways you can take 30 minutes or an hour, for example, and carve it up. Part of it, or much of it, depends on your personal goals for your practice and for your level of where you're at right now and your difficulty level. So there's a lot of ways to do it. What I want to do today is talk about some common ways to do it. I'll give you guys a glimpse into my personal practice routine, my regimen. But before we get into that, I want to actually introduce you guys to a really special pianist. He's become a friend of mine. Uh, he's one of Quincy Jones's artists that Quincy manages. He's a young prodigy. His name is Justin Coughlin. He's an awesome jazz pianist. He lost his sight when he was nine years old, so he's blind. And he is an incredibly inspiring positive human and an amazing player. We had Justin in my studio recently here to shoot some lesson content for Playground Sessions. So we'll be introducing that hopefully soon. But I wanted to give a teaser. So here's Justin Coughlin talking about a bit of his practice routine. I'll see you guys on the other end. I want to take this time to talk about practice and I think my approach to it, how it's changed over the years, and uh, maybe some, some tips. For me, always good to have some time in the beginning to warm up. I, and this is where I'm so grateful for the classical training that I had because that's the best way for me to get into it. And no matter how advanced my, the rest of my practice time might be, there's nothing better than scales and arpeggios. I think they've always been the foundation. And uh, I mean, sports, they always talk about fundamentals and I think um, doing scales, major, minor, and going all the way up and down the keyboard, you know. You never, I don't think you ever graduate from having to do scales and arpeggios. Um, there's always room for improvement too. Uh, if something, it is just making it more legato, right? Not, but really connecting the notes and, and. You know, um, so that's a big part of the, the practice routine. Um, getting, just getting warmed up. Then I go into classical music. Um, some pieces that I just always have in my arsenal. So it's usually Bach and Chopin. And that's an even better way to get into the piano because you're really playing something that, that forces your hands to do interesting things. Um, that's a part of it. Then the next part 
is repertoire. I like to explore new songs, things that I can add to my arsenal of, of, of pieces that I, that I like, and it's usually inspired by something that I've discovered, or maybe I go into the Great American Songbook and find something that I want to spend time with. And the last part of my practice routine is something that's really a challenge for me. It's, it's really important to challenge yourself during your practice time. You should be pushing those boundaries and reaching for something new. Uh, and that's a, definitely a big part of my practice session. What I'm doing now is trying to have my left hand uh, be a little stronger. And one way to do that is to practice improvising over a song that I know and I'm comfortable with, like uh, the blues, for instance. So. So that was, um, you know, definitely a challenge. Um, but uh, you know, that's something that I'll do during my practice routine to, to push me to do something new. Okay, so. Say hey to Justin, everybody. We're really excited to be introducing him in a much bigger way as part of our Playground Sessions family and community here. Um, but that's a bit of Justin talking about how he practices. And I love, he, he gets a little bit vulnerable and he actually shows you something that's kind of challenging for him. And that's a, a, a great way to, to break this down is that you gotta find something that challenges you in your practice time. But you also need to find something that you really already have well under your fingers too. In other words, something that's not a challenge uh, for you to kind of get into your practice session. And Justin talked about that as a, as a warm up. So we're gonna talk about Justin's practice routine, but first I just wanna check in with you guys real quick because I'm seeing a lot of comments come through about uh, how to structure out your practice, literally. We've talked a bit so far about how to kind of get ready to practice, but that's what we're about to talk about now. So. Uh, Sean says, I'm curious if there's a structure to practice that works best. A couple other people are saying, Sean, I also want to want to know that as well. So we're going to get into that. I see uh, Laredo is tuning in from Johannesburg. Welcome. And everyone else that's watching, let us know in the comments where you're watching from. Even if it's right here in Ohio with me and Aiden, or if it's in New York City with Chris and David and the rest of the, the, the music team, or anywhere around the world, where are you guys writing in from? And what time is it where you're at? Okay, so let's get back to Justin, and I want to talk about his practice routine. So obviously, the first thing that he does is he does a warm-up. It's a very common uh, thing to do uh, to kick off your practice sessions. And that should be obvious, right? You don't want to have stiff, cold hands, and then go and try to practice something that's technically difficult, right? You got to warm up a little bit, just like anything else that requires physical activity, sports, you know, you gotta, you gotta warm up and stretch before you start running, right? Chris is a runner, he knows what I'm talking about. You can't just start sprinting, right? You gotta start with some warm ups and some stretches, and then you get into it. So Justin Coughlin stretches and warms up, so to speak, with scales and arpeggios. Now for those of you who caught my lesson on how to build technique, we talked a lot about that, right? Scales and arpeggios as a way to practice kind of physically improving uh, with dexterity and speed. And Justin says, I love he says this in, in the clip I just played, he says, you never really graduate from playing scales or arpeggios. I love that, because no matter how advanced you are, I mean, this guy's signed by Quincy Jones. He's still sitting down playing scales. All right, so I hope that's inspiring to you guys and not discouraging, because you can really milk so much out of scales and arpeggios. It's a great warm up. Okay, and then Justin, from there, moves on to classical repertoire. Now for him, that's just, I mentioned earlier, you want to have something that you, you have down, that you don't even have to think about as warm-up. That's Justin's. So he has these classical songs from when he was a kid memorized. So he moves in from scales into those. And that's just kind of an extended warm-up, if you will, okay? 
And then, in this example, Justin got into what he likes to do to challenge himself. And one example is to solo, take like a jazz solo, just with your left hand. And typically, even our, us advanced jazz players, even if we're comfortable soloing with our right hand, typically we play just some chords in the left hand. So Justin has identified an area where he can improve. He's made a plan for his practice time, and he has put some intentional, focused practice on something that challenges him. Because really, that's how you get better, right? So to answer all of your questions, let's move out of Justin now and just talk about during practice in general. Let's talk about how we can structure out our practice, okay? So warm up first, that's crucial. But what is a warm up that's appropriate for you? There's a ton of different kind of things you can do as a warm up. And at the end of the day, warming up really just means loosening up with something that you don't really have to think much about, okay? Because it's about your physical looseness. So it could be scales, could be arpeggios. If you already know your scales, maybe it could be four octave scales up and down. Maybe it can be faster than some other people. So you can sort of adjust the details of your warm-up exercise to match your skill level, okay? But scales are great, arpeggios are great. Any song that you have memorized or is relatively easy for you to do without too much thought, that's your warm-up. Okay? In terms of a ratio uh, of your entire practice time, how much of that percentage of that time do you want to be spending warming up? That's also a little bit dependent on some of the specifics around your practice time that day. For example, if I was walking in the snow uh, home, I missed my ride, for example, and I get home and I'm freezing, I'm probably going to have to spend more time warming up before I'm ready to really play. Um, on the flip side, if I've been jamming with my friends for a while and then I got to go to my piano lesson and, and, and practice for my teacher, I'm probably more warmed up already. So a lot of this stuff is subjective and I want to really, I really, really want to send this point home to you guys that there isn't one right formula for this many minutes on this, this many minutes on that, that many minutes on this, and then you're practicing right. It doesn't work like that. You have to take a look at your own context and you have to apply uh, this structure uh, in a flexible way so that it fits where you're at, okay? The one thing that is constant, I'll say, is you gotta warm up, okay? But again, what you do and for how long, it can be flexible, it's up to you. But once you get those warm-ups down, the next thing you wanna do is, let's call it chunk one. Now, I talked earlier about dividing your full time into smaller chunks. Now, this is where, where it really gets subjective because everyone's working on different stuff. If I've got two hours to practice and I'm an advanced player, I might have five chunks in my practice time, okay? If I've only got 15 minutes and I just gotta work on one song, maybe that's just one chunk, okay? So here, this is the section where I'll just say chunks, maybe plural, whatever that is for you, okay? It could be a song, typically, or it could also be sight reading. Many, many people want to work on their reading ability. And that's a great thing to practice as well because you also kind of get to know songs that way. If you pull up a random song section in our app and you just hit play, that's how you practice sight reading. See how you can do, all right? And then the added bonus is now you're playing through other songs in the app. But that, I should tell you, is much different practice than working on a song. Sight reading and learning a song should be approached very differently in your practicing. So if your first chunk of your, the first meaty portion of your practice, if that is sight reading, you don't want to sit there and memorize a song, right? You want to practice reading something cold that you don't know and then move on to the next song before you start to get to know that song because then you're not working on sight reading anymore. Now on the flip side, if your chunk is to learn a song, you got to really dive into that song and really learn it and don't move on too quickly from a certain section, okay? So whatever your first chunk is, you warm up first and you get into it. Justin Coughlin's was to pull up some classical songs. Uh, yours may be something different. If you have more chunks after that, then you get into them after that. But when you're done with your meat of your lesson, then there's your practice time, okay? But once you're practicing, regardless of where you are, if you're in warm-up, chunks, cool down, 
there's a couple of things I want you to keep in mind that just apply generally to practicing, okay? And these are really important. The first one is repetition. How many times have you heard me say repetition in these lessons that I'm offering here on YouTube? How many times have you heard me say, do it again, do it again, right? That's so crucial. And humans are wired in this way, most of us at least, where we get something, you know, once or twice, and then we kind of want to go see what's next. You have to stifle that impulse, okay? You got to sit with stuff longer than you think, and you got to repeat more often than you think, all right? Applies to anything. The next thing I want to say is you got to practice something more times correctly than you d did it incorrectly. Now, what does that mean? That sounds kind of weird, right? Well, think about this. Let's say I'm learning how to play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Whoops, messed up. Messed up. Got it. Now I know Mary had a little lamb. Now I'm going to move on. That's not how we do it, okay? Because what I just did was practice it, I think, three or four times wrong and only one time right. So think about what that does to our muscle memory in our hands. Every time you practice something, it's internalizing. So I just practiced something four times wrong and only one time right. My hands don't really have it yet, okay? So it's crucial that you, you adopt this little mantra. You gotta do it more right than wrong. So if it takes me 10 times of sort of messing it up before I get it, ideally you then wanna go more than 10 times in a row of doing it right. That's truly how you will internalize something in your muscle memory, okay? So more, often, more times right than you did it wrong. And lastly, I'll say patience and forgiveness. This is also crucial in our practice time. It's so easy for us to judge ourselves, isn't it? We find any excuse that we can to rag on ourselves. In daily life, I would say, a lot of us do. Especially as we are in the pursuit of something like learning an instrument, where we put our heart and our souls into it and other people listen, and we feel like our self-worth even can be tied into that, right? So it, it can be sticky. And there's a really, really important thing that you must keep with you as you are learning an instrument and as you're practicing. And that is to forgive your mistakes and be patient with your progress. It's so important that you don't judge yourself for how long it's taking you to get something down, for example. Or maybe somebody else in the app completed that segment before you did. Or maybe someone in your family is progressing faster than you. It's so important that you forgive your process and your progress and that you're patient with yourself. So I just want to say that as well. Don't get discouraged if you feel like you're hitting a speed bump, a hurdle, or like a really steep, you know, climb in your piano journey because you will always come down the other end of that and you'll, the more challenges you face, the better you'll get on the other end. So be patient and forgive yourself. So that's just a bit of how we can structure our practice session. Again, it can be fluid and in fact it should be a bit flexible from session to session, but there are a few constants that remain, and we'll just summarize here. We gotta make a plan for our time, we gotta divide it into chunks, and we have to set goals, we have to repeat stuff often, all that stuff, okay? Now, let's move on. What I wanna do is talk a little bit about my own practice routine. I wanna give you guys a glimpse, I'm gonna play a little bit as well, um, but we're gonna keep it short, um, and let's go over that now. So, of course, again, everyone's gotta warm up to start. But what you do to warm up kind of depends on, on what, you're, what you're working on and where you're at. So I've covered a little bit of this in uh, the building technique lesson, but I'll give you just a quick glimpse into some of my warm-ups that I might do. I definitely love doing scales. And there's a couple of things I'm thinking about when I'm practicing scales. I'm thinking about even timing, thinking about smooth articulation. In other words, I'm not doing this. I'm going, every note is held until the next note, and so on. I'm also thinking about um, accents. I don't want to accent one note more than another. If I do, it might sound like this. 
Something to keep in mind with scales is whenever our thumbs go down, uh, we tend to want to be heavy with our thumbs. So that kind of creates this sound. So when I'm practicing scales and I'm warming up, I want to make sure that my, my dynamics, my accents, my articulations are all um, being exercised as well. So I'm thinking about that when I do scales, and I could do longer scales, I could do faster scales. Um, I also like to do uh, non-scale drills, specifically for these fingers, okay? These are our weakest fingers. So what I like to do is give them a little extra uh, strength practice, extra weight lifting, if you will. And I like to do something like this. It's super awkward, but it's just these two fingers. I'm going down in whole steps. So it's a note and a whole step down. Then I take that same pattern and I move it down a half step. So here, then here, then here. And I'm just walking down the entire keyboard, thinking about a few things as I do it. Again, even timing. I'm also thinking about relaxing my hand and wrist and fingers. It's easy when you're playing with only these fingers to get kind of tense. So that's the point of this warm-up. You don't want to see this. Individual fingers straining like that. You want to let the, the toggle motion happen with your wrist and keep everything relatively relaxed. Do the same thing with the left, moving up. Okay? So that's my warm-up, all right? And then I get into a bit of improvisation. Now, for those who know me and have seen some of these lessons before, uh, you know that I love to improvise. I'm a jazz musician. And so again, here comes uh, my chunk number one of my practice. I'm not working on sight reading right now, I'm not working on learning a song. I'm actively working on improvising. Specifically, getting out of my own way and just letting the ideas flow. You have to practice that. Okay? So then I sit down and for, it depends on how much time I have for my session, but a good chunk of my session, let's say, I don't know, let's say I have an hour, I have warm up for 10 minutes, I might improvise for 20 to 30 minutes, okay? I'll close my eyes, I'll get in the zone, and remember, if you've cleaned and respected your space, and you've got your, your life on airplane mode, you should be able to really sink into what you're doing. So I practice improvising. And I could keep going, of course, and I would uh, for, for a good chunk of time, okay? When I'm done with that, when I'm done with that, I could then go into a song or some sight reading. It just depends on what I'm working on in that moment. Sometimes I have performances coming up where I got to learn a bunch of music. Well, most of my practice time leading up to that, of course, is going to be occupied by learning that music. Other times I might have a jazz concert coming up where it's just me playing for like four hours. I got to learn music, but I also got to really loosen up with my improvising. So I might spend more time practicing improvising. You see where I'm going. Okay, and I also like to improvise a bit at the end to cool down. Um, I don't like to get really intense and then walk away. I, I like to kind of come back down and work on my soft touch and work on patience and slow speed and leaving space in between stuff. That's something that improvisers have to practice often as well, because we tend to want to fill in all the space with all sorts of stuff. Okay? There's just a glimpse into my practice regimen, you guys. It, it's going to look different for everyone. Mine and Justin Coughlin's look different. Chris Vance's looks different. David Size's looks different. But I guarantee we all share this loose structure of a chunk of time to warm up, a big chunk or multiple big chunks for what your goals are in that moment, and some kind of a cool down as well is helpful. Some sight reading practice is helpful. But what I'd like you guys to do now is write in the comments a bit about your practice routines. It can be one sentence, it can be more. Tell me something that you've done that has really helped, that you've learned, that might help other people watching this video. You can share your tips with them. Or share a frustration you may have. What is happening in your practice sessions that is 
having a negative effect on you, on your, you know, attitude towards piano or on your actual playing, what's a frustration that you can't really solve that you'd like to discuss? Okay? Go ahead and put it in the comments, guys. And, and uh, what I'd like to do now is check in a bit and see what you guys have been talking about. I, I've seen some activity come through, and I'm happy to see that. So let's see what's going on. Um, I asked you guys to tell me where you're writing from. That's awesome. I see, oh man, I gotta scroll up quite a bit. Thanks for writing in everyone and, and hanging out. All right, so I'm seeing someone commenting that noise canceling headphones would be great uh, for practicing. Great idea, yes, especially as you say in busy areas. Uh, the New York team often has traffic sounds and stuff outside. Great idea, some noise canceling headphones. Um, I see someone saying, what up, David Sides? Yep, everyone, David and Chris are both hanging out with us today. Um, all right. T. Michelle says, my son spends a lot of time playing around on the piano during his practice. Is it meaningful? Oh, that's a great question. So a lot of people might hear what I'm doing when I practice as messing around, and they might be right. It depends on what our goals are. If, you're, if, you're, if your son is supposed to be practicing hand and exercises, but instead he's playing this, <laughs> he's messing around. <laughs> but if he's supposed to be, if, if that portion of his practice time was carved out to have some free fun time at the piano, that really is important too. Not everything we do at the piano has to be about drills and, and specific work on something that is technical. We gotta also work on our emotional connection to the piano. We gotta make sure we're having fun still. So I would say to you that you should 100% let your son mess around or whatever he wants to do on the piano. But I would suggest that you balance that with some other thing that he may not wanna do as much. And you could tell him, hey, if you get your scales done or if you work on that song for 10 minutes, then the rest of your practice session can be, you know, having some fun. That could be a great way to do it. All right, let's see what else you guys got. I see uh, John Sandlin's talking about noodling. Oh yeah, that was his response to that. So noodling, or whatever you want to call it, can be really valuable as well. Let's keep going. I want to check in with a few more of you guys. Alex says, I'm watching from Wyoming. It's 10.30 a.m. Watching from work. That's awesome. I'm broadcasting from work. This is my work. But uh, don't tell your boss. Uh, we don't want to get you in trouble. David Sides is hanging in Brooklyn. Man, I wish you guys could see his view from his piano. He's looking at the skyline. Uh, that must be a nice Saturday morning, David. Nitty Cat, I think it says, is writing from Northern California. Best way to start my weekend. Awesome. So it sounds like this time is really working for you guys, this day and time. Uh, so we'll keep that in mind. Anita is writing in, first timer from South Carolina. Thanks for joining us, Anita, that's awesome. Let us know how you're digging the lesson and if you've tried Playground, if you've tried the app, we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, good morning from St. Louis. Uh, T. Michelle says, I'm not musically inclined, so I don't know these things. So that actually brings me to a quick point I'll make. With these live lessons, sometimes it's hard to get, uh, to present stuff in a appropriate difficulty level for everyone watching. Sometimes we have rookie level players and advanced level players watching. So what we're gonna try to do is start to tailor some of the lessons towards certain difficulty levels. Last week what we did was a rookie level rhythm lesson. I asked you guys to vote what difficulty level of rhythm lesson you wanted, and you said rookie. So we might start to do some more stuff like that. I might say, hey guys, next week we're gonna do an advanced lesson and then you'll know, right? And then we'll, we'll, we'll try to get the advanced uh, viewers in. Other times we might say, hey guys, this is gonna be a beginner lesson. And other times we might try to hit a range. Um, but s not every week will there be something that necessarily caters to you each time. But we're gonna try our best, okay? Keep, keep tuning in. And hopefully, even if there's a, a concept or something that we go over that is not uh, super clear for you, maybe you can ask a question for clarification or still just Enjoy the hang and say hey to your fellow playgrounders and, uh, and all that, okay? So thanks for writing in. Um, let's go ahead and find one more question and then we're going to wrap up for the day. Is that cool? I see you guys have a lot of uh, comments today, so I want to get to them. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right, so Chris, so Chris 